Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Today's episode involves sexual assault and serial murder, so I would like to emphasize listener discretion. Last week, I covered a vicious serial killer, Bobby Joe Long, who murdered 10 women in the Tampa Bay area and raped more than 50 women before he began killing. This week, we have another serial killer, but he may not be as prolific as he once claimed. Known as the Redneck Ted Bundy, Jeremy Brian Jones has technically only been convicted for the rape and murder of one woman, but he has confessed to over a dozen murders and then retracted those claims. He did this over and over again. You see, Jeremy Jones loved the attention. Even though he once shouted loudly to reporters, I ain't no Ted Bundy, It would seem like he idolized him and enjoyed the comparison. Jones was known to be disarmingly charming and was a relatively attractive man, though his use of meth marred his once handsome face. But the suffering he caused so many families with his lies compounds the tragedies he is responsible for. Family members of murder victims and missing persons live lives of agony. That sort of pain never goes away. And false confessions can bring false hope which is unspeakably cruel to those who have already suffered the violent loss of a loved one. Jones is suspected in at least two other cases and charges were filed, but hurricanes, politics, and the slow crawl of American justice have delayed prosecution in those cases. And there is a possibility he was involved in other murders. He has too many coincidental connections to several unsolved cases, but his inability to shut his redneck mouth has tainted those investigations, and it looks like those families will never get the closure they deserve. Welcome to Episode 73, Meth, Lies, and Murder, The Redneck Ted Bundy. At around midnight on Halloween in 2002, a lovely brunette in a Betty Boop costume stepped outside a bar where a lively costume party was going on. It was at Gibson's nightclub in Douglasville, Georgia. She told her boyfriend she would be right back. She was going out to her truck to get something. Minutes later, Tina Mayberry staggered back into the bar, bleeding and gasping for air. She had been stabbed multiple times and had many defensive wounds on her hands. Her boyfriend, Darren Smith, ran quickly to his girlfriend and applied pressure to her wounds as patrons of Gibson's called 911 frantically. Tina was taken to Atlanta Medical Center about 20 or so miles from the bar, but she died two hours later. She was never able to give a description of her attacker. And there was no clear motive. She was not robbed or raped. She was stabbed while standing outside her own pickup truck in a well-lit parking lot along a busy road in Douglasville. More than 100 people at the party saw her that night and were questioned. But it was late, it was a bar, and most people were drunk. Police say witnesses remembered things differently, both before and after Tina drug herself back into the bar, bleeding her life's blood. Tina Mayberry was 38 years old and had been with her boyfriend for three years. He was planning on proposing soon. They already owned a house together, and they loved to travel. They had just spent about two weeks in the Canadian Rockies a few months before Tina was murdered. Tina's mother told the Atlanta Journal-Constitution that Tina was in a high point in her life. She was happy in her relationship, loved her job, and was really just enjoying her life. She was dressed as Betty Boop that night because she loved the cartoon character and collected Betty Boop memorabilia. One investigator on the case said it was one of the worst crime scenes he had ever been to. And even with a $5,000 reward, no one came forward. The investigator thought it was possibly due to fear of retaliation from the killer. But another detective said of the witnesses at the bar that night, quote, they either don't know, don't care, or don't remember. Police even had security footage from a camera pointed at the parking lot from a nearby business that showed a car speeding away. But the footage was too grainy to even get the make and model of the car, much less a license plate number. Darren, even though he was seen in the bar when Tina was attacked, was fully investigated, as detectives noted that statistically, Most victims know their murderer, but he was quickly cleared by witnesses who saw him at the bar. Darren and Tina's parents naturally were devastated by her murder, 
and their heartache grew as the mystery seemed to hit a dead end with no leads. In 2004, Jeremy Brian Jones would give Tina's family hope. Hope that her case would finally be solved and Tina could rest in peace. Jones, in jail for another brutal rape and murder, spontaneously confessed to Tina's murder. He was a drifter from Oklahoma, but in Douglasville, he was known as John Paul Chapman. He had met his then-girlfriend, Vicki Freeman, at Gibson's nightclub. Unfortunately, there was no physical evidence linking Jeremy Jones to Tina Mayberry's murder. There were no witnesses. The only detail that made sense was that Jones did frequent Gibson's nightclub, but that was not enough for a murder charge. Tina's family, having already suffered for two years, were again devastated when charges were not brought. Investigators really felt they had the right man, but it was more of a gut feeling. Everything Jeremy Jones knew about Tina Mayberry's murder could have been gleaned from newspaper reports, but something made them think he was their guy. That's because Jeremy Brian Jones is a sadistic killer. While he would only be charged in three cases, he confessed to over 22 murders over several states. It has been almost 17 years since Tina Mayberry was brutally stabbed to death. There was seemingly no motive. She had no enemies. It seems like a senseless crime of opportunity that she met with an actual monster on the night of Halloween. But was she being stalked? Or was she targeted that night simply for being a beautiful woman with long, dark hair? Jeremy Jones, known as the redneck Ted Bundy, preferred women with long, dark hair, just like the real Ted Bundy. I'm going to pause now for a short commercial break. Jeremy Brian Jones was born in Miami, Oklahoma in April of 1973. The town is actually spelled Miami, as in the one in Florida. But in Oklahoma, the town is named for the Native American Miami tribe. It's in the county of Ottawa, also named for a local tribe. It's definitely a dusty small town, built around lead and zinc mining beginning in 1907. When Jeremy was growing up, the population was around 13,000. His parents divorced early in his life, and he was raised by his stepfather and his mother, Jean Beard. He also has a half-brother named Jesse. From his mother's viewpoint, Jeremy had been a good boy until he got to high school and got in with the wrong crowd. Jeremy Jones himself told many reporters that he embraced the, quote, thug mentality. He went on to say, quote, They had all the money, the motorcycles, the women. For a while, I had all that, too. In January of 1990, Jean went to pick up her 16-year-old son from school. She found him fighting with another boy and tried to break it up. Her own son turned around and hit her, knocking her to the ground. This was Jeremy's first brush with the law. He was charged as a juvenile for assaulting the boy and his mother. Following this, his behavior only got worse and his parents transferred him to another high school about 20 minutes away from Miami and Quapaw. He didn't fare much better there. He wasn't involved in any more physical assaults, at least none were reported, but he was disrespectful to teachers and had a bad attitude overall. This is when he really started his thug life image. The bad boy drinking, smoking pot, and eventually trying and getting hooked on meth. And oddly, he was known as a ladies' man and was popular with the girls. Later in life, he would brag that he could charm the panties off a nun. Regardless of that supposed charm, Jeremy Jones preferred sexual violence. He was charged with his first rape in November of 1995 in Miami, and two months later, he was charged with a second rape and unlawful possession of methamphetamine. A day after this, yet another woman came forward and reported to police that Jones had held a pistol to her vagina and threatened to kill her. He was also arrested for this incident and charged with sexual battery. There is not much information to be found on these early assaults. Like most states, 
Oklahoma has a rape shield statute to protect the victims, so there wouldn't have been much about it in the papers. And despite Jeremy's juvie record, the courts gave him an incredible break. They placed him in a program for delayed sentencing designed for young adult offenders. I would like to point out that he was 21 years old here. While that may be young, it's damn sure old enough to go to jail for three sexual assaults. He was sent to the Hominy, Oklahoma, Dick Connor Correctional Center for evaluation. He managed to con the staff into believing that meth and alcohol had destroyed his life and he was truly repentant for what he had done. His mother always had his back too, assuring police and staff at the center that her son came from a loving and stable home and that he had a good life ahead of him. That was bullshit. Later in court records, Jean Beard testified that she and her husband fought often during Jeremy's childhood and that his stepfather was an abusive alcoholic, which is interesting as Jean and her husband both supported him during his trial. Even more interesting, in 2007, Jean Beard was convicted of possession of a controlled substance within 1,000 feet of a school. In an October 2005 raid at Beard's home, Miami police found meth, a scale, plastic baggies, and 23 weapons, including a loaded 25 caliber Derringer. They also seized surveillance equipment. Jean was given a five-year deferred sentence and ordered to serve 10 days in the Ottawa County Jail, and the felony gun charges were dropped. Though this was years after her son's early crimes, it was only a year after his eventual arrest for rape and murder. If you ask me, the apple didn't fall far from the meth tree. And that sentence is bullshit. Dropping the felony weapons charge with that many weapons and drugs in a home is unconscionable, not to mention the amount of meth along with scales and baggies, would suggest that Jean and her husband were dealers, not just users. But I digress. Let's get back to the timeline. After fooling the counselors at the treatment center, Jeremy Jones got a positive report saying he was a good candidate for rehabilitation. He received five years of probation from the three charges of sexual battery, to which he pled no contest. He was ordered to report for DNA testing, but managed to slip out of this as well. He just kept forgetting to show up for the lab test. He was also ordered to attend mandatory sex offender classes. He complained to his mother that he didn't like sitting there with a bunch of perverts, that he didn't belong there. He was finally kicked out of the sessions for making a scene. His probation was revoked, but he was already in the wind. By December of 2000, he knew he needed to leave Oklahoma. He caught a Greyhound bus and was headed to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where he had family friends. Before he left, his uncanny luck worked out for him again. While drinking at a bar, he met a woman whose son was locked up in Missouri. Jeremy plied his charm on this lady, insisting he had been framed. The woman gave him her son's social security number and the name, John Paul Chapman. And just like that, Jeremy Brian Jones was off the grid. There are rumors that his mother, Jean, actually got him the new identity, befriending the woman herself. If it's true, her son never threw her under the bus for it. He wasn't in Tuscaloosa long before he heard that an Oklahoma bounty hunter was in the area looking for him, so he picked up and moved again, this time to Mobile, Alabama. Though he was still heavily into meth and drinking a lot, he managed to get a job with a well-respected man with a construction business. Mark Bentley even allowed Jeremy, who he knew as John Chapman, to stay at his home for a while until he got on his feet. Jeremy got an Alabama driver's license with John Paul Chapman's social security number. His new identity was complete. Jones was still a smooth-talking and charming man. He soon became known as John Paul Oklahoma Chapman, a nickname he enjoyed. But Mark Bentley and his family soon grew tired of Oklahoma and his drug use. They asked him to move out. He checked into a motel and met another man named Craig Baxter from Douglasville, Georgia, who was in Mobile working a temp job. 
He told Jeremy, a.k.a. John, that if he was ever in Douglasville to look him up. Within a couple of months, Jeremy called Craig and said that he had been mugged. Craig wired him some money, and then Jeremy showed up on his doorstep without warning. Craig allowed Jones to stay in his basement, although his wife Jan was not happy about it. She later said that Jeremy made her feel uncomfortable. So soon, he was out on his ass again, begging another friend for a place to stay. Another friend named John McIntosh let him stay at his house and got him a job as a welder in Douglasville. For the first time, Jeremy needed to use the John Chapman identity for a background check. He passed. John McIntosh and his wife Carrie were having marital issues already, and like Jan Baxter before her, this John Chapman made Carrie feel uneasy. He also seemed to egg on arguments with her husband, but he stayed tentatively with the unhappy couple. Jones also made many derogatory remarks about women in Carrie's presence, saying they needed to be smacked around and put in their place. One of his favorite jokes was, quote, what do you tell a woman with two black eyes? Nothing. You done told the bitch twice. On Halloween night of 2002, Jeremy helped the Macintosh's son, Matt, with his Halloween costume. Matt and his friends were going as the rock band Kiss, and Jeremy did their makeup. After that, Jeremy, or John Chapman to these people, went out on the town himself. Remember, he was now living in Douglasville. And on Halloween night of 2002, Gina Mayberry was stabbed to death at a bar in Douglasville called Gibson's, a bar that Jeremy hung out at a lot. There is no proof that he was there that night, but he did later confess to Tina's murder, and investigators felt his story rang true. One detective said that Tina had fought back hard and that Jeremy had told him that the woman had whooped his ass. At the time, though, Tina's murder was an open case, with Douglasville law enforcement baffled. With no physical evidence to tie him to the crime, even after his confession, Jeremy would not be charged with Tina's murder. I think it's very possible he was trying to abduct her from that parking lot by scaring her with a knife, and when she fought back so hard, he stabbed her repeatedly. Jeremy started kicking up his drug use around this time, too, causing even more friction in the McIntosh home. In early 2003, he brought a woman home with him from the bar, but she left quickly after she got there. And then the police came knocking. She had accused Jeremy, a.k.a. John Chapman, of choking her and trying to rape her. Unfortunately, because she had been drunk and went willingly with Jones, she wasn't believed. McIntosh apparently vouched for his drug addict friend that caused so many problems at his home. But he would soon be rid of him. Jeremy met Vicki Freeman at Gibson's Bar in late summer of 2003. By September, they moved in together, renting an apartment in Villa Riga, Georgia. Vicki was 15 years older than him, but was immediately in love. She told author Sheila Johnson, quote, I was just lost in him. A month after he and Vicki moved to Villa Riga, Jeremy was arrested for indecent exposure and public indecency. He had become obsessed with a teenage neighbor at the apartment complex. This 18-year-old girl named Brittany told her parents that Jones creeped her out. He started coming over to her apartment when her parents weren't home, trying to get into the door when she wouldn't answer. Eventually, after not being able to get Brittany alone, he sat outside her apartment, and when she came out, he exposed himself to her. After his arrest, her parents found a box outside Brittany's bedroom window. It held rope, a roll of tape, and binoculars. Jeremy was processed through the Douglas County Jail and his fingerprints were checked with the state of Georgia's system. As he had been arrested under the name John Paul Chapman, his prints were new to the Georgia system. His driver's license was from Alabama. He had no outstanding warrants or record in either state so he was allowed to make bond and was released from jail. He took a plea, got probation, and no jail time. But worse, the GBI say that they ran John Paul Chapman's prints through APHIS, the FBI's nationwide computerized fingerprint system. On January 22, 2004, Jones was picked up again, 
this time in Carroll County, for two counts of criminal trespassing. Once again, his prints did not flag his true identity or that he was a wanted sex offender from Oklahoma. That was now three times that John Paul Chapman, with Jeremy Brian Jones' fingerprints, was arrested in Georgia. Three times his prints were ran through APHIS, and he still wasn't caught as a felon on the run from Oklahoma. In early March of 2004, Jeremy, a.k.a. John, and his girlfriend Vicky decided to move. His reputation around their apartment complex could not be rehabilitated. They moved to the Arbor Village trailer park near Douglasville, Georgia. On March 12th, a 16-year-old girl named Amanda Greenwell went missing from Arbor Village. Amanda had been on her way to a payphone and had simply vanished. Her body wouldn't be found until April 20th. She had been stabbed and her neck had been snapped. Unfortunately, her remains were too decomposed and had been scattered by animals. There was no way to know for sure if she had been raped, but it seemed like the most likely motive. Amanda had been a beautiful girl, with long, dark, thick, and shining hair. She was just Jeremy's type. Jeremy was questioned along with all the residents of the Arbor Village trailer park. He was not suspected, nor were any of their other neighbors. No evidence was found near Amanda's body. The case hit a wall with no leads, for now. On April 15th, just five days before April's body was found, a beautician named Patrice Andres went missing from the salon she owned on State Route 369 in Cumming, Georgia. Patrice was 38 years old and went missing in the 20 minutes she had given herself for lunch between two appointments. So the alarm was raised fairly quickly when the second customer came in and found Patrice was gone. Her purse was on the floor and had been rifled through. And all the cash was missing from her till. Like Amanda and Tina Mayberry, Patrice was petite with long, dark hair. Patrice was well-loved in her small community. Friends compared her to the character Dolly Parton played on Still Magnolias, a small-town beautician named Truvy. They loved coming to her shop, and she always listened to their troubles. She was active in her church and had many friends. The search for Patrice was intense, with friends, relatives, and church members raising some $17,000 for a reward and tirelessly searching for the beloved woman. Around this time, Jeremy started calling his old friend John McIntosh a lot. He kept telling him he had screwed up again. McIntosh figured he just meant he was on an uncontrolled meth binge. But later, he would wonder if the friend he knew as John Chapman was intimating far worse crimes. On June 15th, Jones was arrested again, this time for possession of marijuana, meth, drug paraphernalia, and obstruction of justice. He spent a week in jail, with his prints once again being run through the Georgia database and APHIS. Once again, he made bond. But this time, he decided to get the hell out of Georgia. He had always followed weather reports for the Gulf Coast. He knew that hurricanes always brought a lot of temporary workers for the cleanup and construction. It was easy money and an easy job to get, especially if you have a valid license with no record in that state. And Hurricane Ivan was headed toward Mobile, Alabama in September of 2004. Jeremy drove to Mobile and showed up on his old friend Mark Bentley's doorstep. Though the Bentleys had kicked him out the last time, Mark gave him another chance. He and his wife, Kim, were going to wait out the storm in a safer inland location. Mark's cousin, Scooter, was staying to watch the trailer. And Mark said that Jeremy, a.k.a. John Oklahoma Chapman, could stay with him. By September 16th, Ivan made landfall west of Gulf Shores as a Category 3 hurricane with historic storm surges. The eye was due over Mobile on the 15th, and residents were taking cover or fleeing. In all, Ivan would be responsible for 92 American deaths, but none in Alabama. Mobile was not hit as hard as expected. But with Ivan came a different sort of threat, one no one was worried about as they got their families to safety and boarded up their homes. Lisa Marie Nichols, a 45-year-old grandmother, 
had picked up her two grown daughters and grandbaby and left for safer ground. The beautiful brunette with long, luscious hair looked more like a sister to her two daughters than someone old enough to be a grandmother. And she had caught the eye of Jeremy Brian Jones. I'm going to pause now to hear a word from our sponsors. Lisa Marie Nichols lived alone in a mobile home in Turnerville, just north of Alabama. On September 15th, as Ivan was bearing down, she decided to go with her daughter Amber and Amber's fiancé Todd to a motel room on the western side of Mobile. While not out of the path of the hurricane, a motel is much sturdier than a mobile home. Lisa's neighbors had also mostly evacuated. Her next-door neighbor was Mark Bentley, the man who had once given Jeremy Jones a job and was now letting him house-sit with his cousin Scooter, while Mark and his family went to Chickasaw, north of Mobile, to wait out the storm. As I said, Mobile and the surrounding areas were not hit as bad as expected, but there was some damage and cleanup, and around 500,000 households were without power, including Lisa's neighborhood. Lisa, Amber, and Todd went to her mobile home the next morning to check out the situation. There were downed tree limbs and branches, but nothing major. However, there were signs that someone broke into the home during the storm. They weren't sure yet, and it was still fairly dark, so they couldn't tell if anything was missing. Since the power was still out, Lisa went home with Amber and Todd. The next day, she went to her job at Bruno's supermarket at 6 a.m., she clocked out shortly before 3 p.m. and stopped to check on her daughter Amber on her way home. She called Amber again when she got home and was unloading groceries. And then between 7 and 8 p.m. that evening, another neighbor thought they heard a small explosion nearby. But with the storm damages and electricity outings, it was possibly a transformer, and they didn't think much of it. Mark Bentley and his family returned to his trailer around dinner time that evening. He came in the door just as Jeremy Jones, the man he knew as John Chapman, was stepping out of the shower. A few hours later, he said he heard Jones outside fooling around with gas cans. He thought Jones was trying to go riding on a four-wheeler and told him it was too late. He looked in later and found him lying on the living room couch. The next day, Amber and Jennifer, Lisa's other daughter, kept calling their mother and got no answer. Lisa always answered when her daughters called, and the girls were very worried. Jennifer, Amber, and Todd decided to go check on Lisa. The first thing they noticed was that Lisa's trailer was still dark while others had power, and her door was open. Lisa never left her door unlocked. With flashlights, the three of them walked in with Todd leading. He was the one to find Lisa's body on the bathroom floor and he tried to block his fiancée Amber and Jennifer from the horror he saw, but it was too late. They had pushed past him. Lisa Marie Nichols had been shot in the head and set on fire. An autopsy would show she had been raped and was killed by three shots to the head. Her killer had set fire to her genitals and her face, trying to hide forensic evidence. The trailer still smelled like smoke, but arson investigators later determined it was too small and didn't hold enough oxygen for the whole trailer to go up in flames. The girls ran screaming from the trailer for help. Mark Bentley and his cousin Scooter ran to Lisa's trailer along with several other neighbors. Mark realized later, through all of the confusion, that John Chapman, Jeremy Jones, had kept his spot on the couch. While the entire neighborhood was in an uproar, Lisa's daughters were screaming hysterically, and the wells of police sirens blared. Jeremy Jones sat passively watching television. Seasoned homicide investigators for the Mobile County Sheriff's Office recognized immediately that this was a sadistic sexual homicide. It didn't look like a first-time murder, and they knew they may not have long before he killed again. They immediately canvassed the neighborhood. Lisa's neighbors were distraught. The lovely young mother and grandmother was very well-liked and loved in their small community. 
People were anxious to help and immediately gave the detectives great tips. They all remembered a stranger who came to town just hours before Ivan hit. They didn't know his real name, but remembered the nickname Oklahoma. One neighbor remembered a strange car sitting outside Lisa's trailer and even remembered a partial tag number. But it was Mark Bentley who gave the detectives the name, birth date, and social security number of his former employee, John Paul Chapman. By then, he had noticed John's indifference to the tragedy and remembered the shower. But Jeremy Jones was in the wind again, slipping away not long after the police arrived. Police agencies all over the area began a manhunt for this John Paul Chapman. Four days later, they got a surprising break. John Chapman called the station and was patched through to the lead detective's cell phone. The detective worked to stretch the conversation saying anything he could to keep Chapman on the phone. Twenty minutes later, Jeremy Jones was shocked when he was surrounded by Mobile County deputies. He was sitting in his car near the bus depot. Once he was in custody, the detective sent out a routine teletype nationwide to see if Chapman was wanted in other states. They also ran his fingerprints through APHIS, which again identified him as John Paul Chapman rather than Jeremy Jones. However, sharp-eyed officials at the Missouri prison, where the real John Paul Chapman was housed, saw the bulletin and called Mobile authorities. They sent a mugshot and fingerprints of their Chapman for comparison. Now the Mobile detectives wondered who the hell they had sitting in jail. It didn't take long to figure out. Jailhouse calls are monitored, and that moron, Jeremy Jones, ever the mama's boy, called his mother, Jean Beard, several times in Miami, Oklahoma. A simple phone call was made to the Miami Police Department, and a detective said yes, they knew a Jean Beard, and she did indeed have a son, with outstanding warrants, who had fled the state years earlier. The detective immediately sent over Jeremy Jones' photos, fingerprints, and rap sheet to the Mobile detectives. And the mama's boy wasn't just dumb enough to call his mother. He called his girlfriend, Vicki Freeman, on September 17th, telling her he had gotten a good job with Mark Bentley and asking her to join him in Mobile. She said find a place for them to live, and she would be there. The thing was, he called her using Lisa Nichols' phone. Vicki Freeman is one of those women who are hard to understand. I get a lot of her problems. Jeremy Jones was physically and even sexually abusive to her. She had reported him to police, but always dropped the charges. But her friends would later confirm the abuse. She said John, the name she knew him as, was always sorry. He could be so sweet. Her friends said that she had a stack of I'm sorry cards that went back a year. No, I definitely understand the psychology of a domestic violence victim. I'm not blaming her at all. The hard part to understand is that even faced with the fact that he lied about who he was, and was charged with the brutal rape and murder of another woman, Vicky still stood by her man. Later, the television show A Current Affair covered the crimes of Jeremy Jones, a.k.a. John Chapman, and featured the romance with Vicky Freeman, who insisted that Jones was, quote, the love you only find once in a lifetime. She vowed to marry him even after he was convicted. She also denied publicly that he had ever abused her. She spoke often to the press, always proclaiming his innocence, despite his lies and abuse of her. He always put me first, she claimed. I have a theory on this. I mean, maybe Jeremy really loved Vicky, but I doubt he was capable of real love. I think she was his surrogate mother, someone he could live off of as he was so often unemployed, someone who babied him and took care of him regardless of how he treated her. As Jeremy Jones sat in jail, law enforcement from Alabama, Georgia, Missouri, Oklahoma, Arizona, and Kansas were going through their unsolved cases to see if there were any similar to Lisa's murder. It wasn't just because of the detective's hunch that this wasn't Jones's first kill. It also wasn't due to his arrest record for three sexual assaults in Oklahoma. Jeremy Jones had started talking, and once he started, he couldn't seem to stop. One of the first murders he confessed to and quickly recanted 
was that of 16-year-old Amanda Greenwell. Vicki Freeman unintentionally gave them evidence on this crime, remembering Jones coming home scratched, bleeding, and covered in mud the day Amanda went missing. Authorities soon found a storage locker Jones had rented and found many disturbing items inside. He had an extensive knife collection and photos of himself posing with those knives. One of the knives matched the murder weapon believed to have been used on Amanda Greenwell and Tina Mayberry. They also found eight photographs of women with long, dark hair. Law enforcement circulated the photos nationwide, and they were put on the America's Most Wanted website. One woman called in, and she was a relative of Jeremy Jones. She was safe, but he had taken the photo. Eventually, all but one of the women in the pictures would be found safe. They found a strand of Mardi Gras beads with a Bud Light logo on them. These would be an important piece of evidence tying Jones to the murder of a sex worker in New Orleans. And most importantly, they found a custom-made ring. It belonged to Amanda Greenwell and was identified by her distraught boyfriend who had it made for her. That directly tied him to Amanda's murder. The ring, along with the knife and Vicky's statement about how he came home covered in blood and mud the day Amanda went missing, was finally enough. Georgia officials charged him with Amanda Greenwell's murder. When he confessed to Tina Mayberry's murder, he again caused a family more grief. He did this without knowing the knife he owned was similar to the murder weapon. This is the Betty Boop Halloween murder. Again, there was no actual physical evidence to connect him to the crime, except for proximity. He lived in Douglasville and went to that bar during the same time period Tina did. She fit his preferred victim profile and looks. He is still considered a suspect, but no charges were ever filed. He made a series of confessions over several months to many murders, and not just sexually motivated attacks. He claimed to have shot and killed a couple named Daniel Oakley and Doris Harris in Delaware County, Oklahoma, in 1996. Oklahoma authorities looked at Jones hard for this case because after the couple were shot, their killer set their trailer on fire. But no definitive evidence could tie him to this double murder. He also said he killed a man named Justin Hutchings from Pitcher, Oklahoma, whose death had been ruled suicide by overdose. Authorities refused to reopen this case, but Justin's family wanted it investigated. Nothing ever came of it, though. He claimed his first murder was back in 1992 when he was 18 years old. Newlywed Jennifer Judd, just 20 years old, was stabbed in her home just days after her wedding. She had been scared and felt like someone was watching her in the days before her murder. She had not been raped, but there had been quite a struggle. Her new husband and high school sweetheart came home and found her body. There is nothing to connect Jeremy Jones to this crime. Like many of his claims, this is unprovable. But again, a family was devastated by the glimmer of hope he provided 12 years after Jennifer's murder. Jones also said he murdered a couple in Commerce, Oklahoma in 1997. Harmon Fenton, 33 years old, and Sarah Palmer, 19, were found shot to death in the bed of a truck that was parked in a shed. Oklahoma authorities again looked hard at Jones for this one, as Jeremy Jones had once worked as a confidential informant. He had bought drugs from Harmon Fenton when he was an informant, so there was a connection. But it wasn't enough evidence to charge him in that case. With all these confessions, authorities from Louisiana came calling, looking at several unsolved murders that would eventually be attributed to serial killer Derek Todd Lee. Jones was also investigated for a vicious string of murders of sex workers by a man known as the truck stop killer. Eventually, a man from Iowa was caught after one victim escaped. In February of 2004, months before Lisa Nichols' murder, a woman named Catherine Collins was murdered in New Orleans. 47-year-old Catherine Collins was a sex worker. Jeremy claimed to have hooked up with her in the French Quarter. They went back to her place, and after she undressed, she for some reason got scared and ran. Jeremy said he chased her down, beat her with a tire iron and the butt of his knife, knocking out several teeth before he stabbed her in her eye, strangled her, 
and mutilated her vagina. None of these specific details had been released to the press, though it was known that she was beaten and stabbed. He initially passed six polygraph tests about the murder of Catherine Collins because New Orleans investigators still had their doubts. While New Orleans wasn't close to where he was living in Georgia, it was less than a seven-hour drive. But when he recanted his confession, investigators went looking for more evidence. They found a witness who identified Jones and his vehicle seen on Elysian Fields Avenue during the time frame. They also found a traffic ticket that one John Chapman got in New Orleans in the days around Catherine's murder. And of course, they had found those Mardi Gras beads in his storage shed. This, along with the matching wounds he described, the traffic ticket, and the eyewitness were enough. New Orleans police charged Jeremy Jones with the rape and murder of Catherine Collins. Jones also confessed to the murder of Patrice Endress, the missing beautician who was so beloved in her community. He said he stopped at her salon to ask for directions and decided she was just his type, so he kidnapped her, raped her, strangled her, and threw her body in a North Georgia creek that fed into the Chattahoochee River. Authorities dragged the creek, used tracking dogs, and wasted countless man hours, but they found no trace of Patrice where Jones claimed he dumped her body. He also confessed to a series of murders of sex workers in Atlanta and Mobile. He named several bridges and bodies of water where he claimed he threw the victims. But law enforcement didn't even have names. They had nothing to go on except that many of the victims were beaten to death with a tire iron, much like Catherine Collins. And sadly, sex workers are often a target. Without a name, they couldn't tie Jones to any of the open murders in Atlanta or Mobile. Perhaps most despicably, he confessed to murdering Danny and Kathy Freeman and abducting Ashley Freeman and Laura Bible. The Bible-Freeman abduction and double murder of Ashley's parents is a huge case. You'd need to be living under a rock to have never heard of it. A fire was started in the Freeman home in Welch, Oklahoma on December 30, 1999. Firefighters found the bodies of the Freeman couple who had been shot to death but Ashley and Laura had vanished. There was no trace of the girls. The search for Ashley and Laura continues to this day, though there was finally an arrest in the case in June of 2018. A man named Ronnie Busick was charged, and it is suspected that he and two friends named Warren Philip Welch and David Pennington murdered the Freemans and abducted the girls. Welch and Pennington had died in the years since the crime, and after his death, a woman who had lived with Phil Welch finally came forward. She had discovered Polaroid photos of the girls, bound and gagged, looking emaciated. It's believed that the three men held the girls, raped and tortured them, and then supposedly threw them in a pit in Pitcher, Oklahoma. The photos were long gone by the time this woman came forward. Jeremy said he murdered the Freemans for a friend to settle a drug debt and that the girls came running out after he had set the fire. He then kidnapped them, raped and murdered them, and threw them down a mine shaft in Kansas. Countless man hours were wasted looking for the girls because of his lies, and Laura Bible's parents were hurt and disappointed all over again. Though they didn't believe he could have acted alone, they had to follow through with his claims and hoped that he named accomplices. He never did. Once Phil Welch's girlfriend came forward, many women and acquaintances of the three men came forward with similar stories. Evidently, more than 12 people stayed quiet about what they knew about the abductions and murders. Most of them were ex-girlfriends who had been threatened and truly feared for their lives. And the families of Ashley and Laura are still waiting for justice. Busick has held up proceedings due to his ill health and his low IQ. His defense team asked for a psych evaluation, holding up a proceeding that was supposed to happen last month. But at least, at last, it looks as though there may be some measure of closure in that case. We just have to hope and pray those girls' remains are finally found. But back in 2004, when Jeremy Jones was running his mouth, no one could be sure, and he seemed like a viable suspect. Aside from the numerous, nameless sex workers Jeremy Jones claimed to have killed, he confessed to the murders of 13 people he did name and whose cases were unsolved. In April of 2005, three things happened. 
Lisa Nichols' daughters, Jennifer and Amber, petitioned the Attorney General's office in Alabama to take over their mother's case. She had been murdered nine months earlier, and they were tired of waiting. Controversially, Attorney General Troy King agreed to take over the case. He was accused of doing it for publicity for his re-election campaign. Also that April, Jones was charged with illegal possession of a firearm as a felon. This was done to block extradition by Georgia or Louisiana for the other two murder charges before Jones could go to trial for the rape and murder of Lisa Nichols. The state of Alabama did not want to risk losing their inmate if the other states moved more quickly. And finally, the third important thing that happened in April is that Jeremy Jones's defense attorney, Habib Yazdi, filed a motion to stop law enforcement from other states coming and questioning his client without his presence. The motion was basically ignored. Jeremy Jones had the right to run his ignorant mouth, no matter what his attorney tried to do to stop him. Jones also blamed all the confessions on the antipsychotic drug Risperdal given to him while he was in jail. But Alabama detectives pointed out that he had already confessed to Lisa Nichols' murder several times and to at least one other victim before he started on the medication. Jones would use this excuse on a pill, but to no avail. Jones said he lied in all his confessions to get more visitation hours, more phone calls, and special foods like pizza, hamburgers, and crab claws. At this point, Jeremy Jones had fully recanted and whined to the media, quote, I get blamed for every unsolved murder now. I ain't no Ted Bundy. But his own big mouth had put him where he was, and he was about to pay for it. In May of 2005, he was formally indicted for the kidnapping, rape, and murder of Lisa Nichols. At this hearing, he heard his defense attorney, Habib Yazdi, ask for a psych evaluation. He screamed out in court, I ain't crazy. Yazdi actually held his hand over his client's mouth in an effort to get him to shut the hell up. It was like something out of a movie. Also in May 2005, the FBI had to make a formal statement apologizing for the error in their system, which allowed a sex offender to remain free. Jones Prince had been run three times before the murders of Catherine Collins and Lisa Nichols, and just six weeks before the kidnapping and murder of Amanda Greenwell. The FBI statement read, quote, The FBI regrets this incident. Law enforcement lost an opportunity to prevent further criminal activity by this individual. This is a worst-case scenario for us. APHIS identifies thousands of fugitives every month, but there are going to be instances like this, however few and far between, where the system just doesn't catch anything. And in this case, it was the most tragic of all consequences. End quote. The FBI got a lot of bad press for failing to identify Jeremy Brian Jones from Oklahoma, a convicted rapist whose prints were on file. Newspapers, television shows, most notably Nancy Grace, took them to task for this epic failure. Nancy Grace had Lisa Nichols' daughters on her show to highlight the devastation caused by the failure of APHIS in the Jones case. In August 2005, the prosecution was dealt a bad blow by the death of Scooter Coleman. He was Mark Bentley's cousin, who was with Jones during the time of Lisa's murder. He had told investigators he knew Jones stole a 25 caliber pistol and told him to put it back. Later, Lisa's family would discover her pistol was missing. When Lisa first got home after the storm, she thought her home had been broken into, but she didn't yet know her gun was missing. She was very likely murdered with her own pistol, though the weapon was never recovered. And now they didn't have Scooter to testify in court. They didn't really need him, though. Jeremy Jones's numerous confessions and behavior seen by neighbors, including his car in front of Lisa's trailer, were enough. The trial of Jeremy Jones for the rape and murder of Lisa Nichols began on October 20, 2005. It was held at the Mobile County Courthouse, despite Yazdi's plea for a change of venue due to publicity. The judge was practically dripping with sarcasm when he informed Yazdi that the publicity was because of his client's own big mouth. And besides, at this point, Jeremy Jones's name and face were known nationwide, 
it wouldn't make a difference. This ruling also held up on appeal. Jeremy Jones took the stand in his own defense and disgustingly blamed the now-dead Scooter Coleman for Lisa's murder. He said that Lisa had been attracted to him and Scooter was jealous. When the prosecutor asked why a lady like Lisa Nichols would be interested in a loser like himself, Jones said, quote, I think I'm very good looking. That brought howling laughter from the spectators in the courtroom. His mama, Jean Beard, and her husband came from Miami and were there every day for the trial along with his long-suffering girlfriend, Vicki Freeman. Jean Beard insisted to reporters at the courthouse steps that her son did not kill Lisa Nichols and, quote, he's a good boy. Jean Beard is a piece of shit who raised a piece of shit. Is it any wonder Jeremy Jones turned out the way he did with a mother like that? I know most parents will defend their children, but in light of her later arrest, I think we all know what kind of mother she really was. Jeremy Brian Jones was found guilty and sentenced to death on October 26, 2005. Once he was transferred to Holman Prison, a death row facility in Alabama, Jones was dismayed to discover he could no longer give interviews to the media per Alabama state law. He still managed to sneak around with his phone privileges, but for the most part, the verbal diarrhea he had been spewing since September of 2004 stopped. He still sits on death row to this day. He has already lost two appeals, but there is no execution date as of yet. And he has not yet been brought to trial for the other two murders he was charged for. Hurricane Katrina hit in August of 2005, right before his murder trial for Lisa Nichols. The hurricane devastated not just the city of New Orleans, but the state of Louisiana and other Gulf Coast states. This put a sad backlog of cases for the state to pursue. It's hard to justify extraditing and trying a man already sitting on death row when there were so many other open cases to get to. I'm not exactly clear on why Jones has not been brought to trial for the murder of Amanda Greenwell. Perhaps Georgia is content with letting Jones sit on Alabama's death row. After all, if he was convicted and sentenced to death, the clock would be set back again with automatic appeals. That makes the most sense to me. As for the other murders he was suspected of, one of the bodies was eventually found, and it cast doubt on many of his other confessions. Patrice Embers' scattered remains were found eight miles from her beauty salon in December 2005. Jeremy Jones had said he drove her more than an hour away from the salon and dumped her in a creek. Of course, he could have simply mixed up his victims. But as there was never any other evidence tying him to Patrice's murder, it made many of his other confessions less credible. Whether or not he actually killed the 13 people he named or the almost 10 sex workers who have not been named, is debatable. Authorities still believe he is the best suspect in Tina Mayberry's murder, as well as the two couples in Oklahoma. Jennifer Judd, his first supposed victim from 1992, is also still a possibility. But there is just not enough evidence in any of those cases to charge Jeremy Jones. Regardless, the anguish he caused the families of all of these victims is horrific. As I said in the opening, family members who have lost loved ones to violent crime live with that agony for the rest of their lives. When that piece of trash Jeremy Jones gave them false hope, it reopened old wounds and upended their lives again. There is no doubt that Jeremy Brian Jones is a rapist and sadistic serial killer and he got a great deal of satisfaction from the attention he received for all of those false confessions. But because he is such a liar, he cast out on many murders he may actually be responsible for. And so unfortunately, for so many families, we will never really know just how many lives that despicable man destroyed. 
Southern Fried True Crime is written and produced by me, Erica Kelly. The original graphic art is by Cully Horner, and Southern Fried's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio. A shout out and thanks to my buddy Aaron from the Generation Y. We toured the Museum of Death together in New Orleans while at CrimeCon, and he came across an exhibit on Jones and said, you gotta do this guy. There is a lot of conflicting stories about Jones on the internet, conflated by his own penchant for lies and exaggeration. But I did find Sheila Johnson's book, Bloodlust, to be really helpful in nailing down the crimes Jeremy confessed to as opposed to the ones authorities actually believe he committed. Reminder, I will be in Charleston, South Carolina next Saturday, October 26th, for the second annual Southern Podcast Meetup. It will be held at Tommy Condon's restaurant from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Come out, have a drink, and hang out with me and some of your favorite Southern podcasters. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on most large platforms like Stitcher and Spotify. If you're interested in supporting the show, please visit my website, southernfriedtruecrime.com. There you can sign up to be a patron of the show, make a one-time donation, or purchase show merchandise. That's southernfriedtruecrime.com. If you have any case suggestions, please email southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. Private messages on social media get lost, so email us best. And please feel free to reach out. I love hearing from you guys. Until next time, thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.